Morning, Sean. Morning, Abasola. How are you? Yeah, good, thank you. How are you? Yes, good. Thank you very much. Cool. Um, so we thought we'd sit and have a chat about World Mental Health Day, which obviously happened on Saturday over the weekend. And I've seen loads of great resources being shared and information being shared about World Mental Health uh, Day more generally. But we thought uh, that we'd sit and have a chat about it specifically in the context of the HE sector. And in particular, the theme for this year was mental health for all. And we thought that that would fit very well with the idea of focusing on good mental health within the university community as a whole. And I thought there was a really interesting quote um, in the whole university framework for mental health paper, um, which talks about how mental healthy learners and healthy staff will increase levels of achievement, performance, productivity and reputation, helping universities conduct their core business more effectively. And I thought that's a really interesting way to look at it. Yeah, I think so. And I think it's just um, a really interesting time. When I say interesting, we could use the cliches of unprecedented or um, unusual or particularly challenged. But the context at the moment with the impact of COVID um, is the same in other sectors in terms of the new ways of working, um, the, the added things. Uh, isolation, um, that's been quite stressful for people, um, that people have been um, facing anxiety, whether that's about the gradual return to work and having to return to campus, um, and, and the uncertainty and the, the stress and the um, anxiety that that creates, uh, alongside what other individual circumstances um, people have faced throughout, throughout lockdown, whether that's care and responsibilities, um, bereavement, um, it could have been um, redundancies. And I think that alongside uh, Black Lives Matter, so it's been a really, uh, in terms of uh, the things that have happened in, in the past six months, then it's been a really, really uh, difficult time and a challenging time. And I think for universities and the higher education sector, it's perhaps slightly different in terms of in terms of the other pressures that obviously during lockdown, the pressure in March was to quickly get things online that weren't weren't already online. Um, so there was that um, and the pressure of making sure that what students and what was delivered to students was of high quality um, in the in this time. And then over the summer, working really hard, preparing for them coming back um, to campus and what was actually perhaps crisis mode, now becoming, dare I say, a new normal. And so there hasn't really been much let up, has there, for them? <laughs> um, and so it's, it's been a really hard period for everybody, but particularly for those working in, in the higher education sector. So I think um, it's worth thinking about that. And we've certainly, haven't we, been having discussions with clients about how their staff are feeling that pressure and how they're coping with it um so yeah it's 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 a difficult time so it's worth it's worth acknowledging it and talking about it i think yeah and i think actually when you when you look at it we've been talking about mental health in the workplace for a long time rightly so um and there has been particular focus on the sector in terms of um mental health of staff so you know, we're aware of the HEPI paper that was published last year, yeah. which looked at increasing numbers of staff being referred for counselling and occupational health services. And whilst it did note that part of that increase in numbers could be down to increased promotion of those services, equally the numbers were quite significant. So it looked at the factors that may contribute to that, such as excessive mm -hmm. workloads, insecure employment, performance management policies. And indeed, the paper was updated in April this year to note that it continues to remain an issue specifically in the context of COVID for the reasons that you've just given. Now, I think in reality, we are in, as you say, unprecedented times where to some extent, increased workloads and, and the need to ensure good performance is part and parcel of day-to-day of -day life. And to some extent, that element of it is unavoidable. But equally, I think that means that there does need to be more of a focus on making sure that institutions have the right tools to deal with the potential consequent impact on mental health. Yeah, I agree. And, and I suppose just being aware of it and making it a priority. And I think for, like you say, over recent years, there's been a lot of, lot of work in relation to student mental health um, and engagement with partners um, and services um, locally for, for campuses and universities in relation to student mental health um, and the OFS and, and UK focusing on that um, and I think um, it has been almost slightly secondary the staff mental health um, and helpfully the the um, the 
mentally healthy universities and the step change um, framework recognizes that and it's for both and it's for the whole community um, but I think there is it's benefited in terms of actually that catalyst of students and the focus on that means that actually now there's the there's the discussion to happen about staff which is good but I think uh, the the um, COVID has really really brought to the fore as well the legal duties um, in relation to mental health um, and so at the moment we we've seen in terms of clients about there's the fear of managers having conversations with individuals about um, talking about their anxiety about perhaps returning to campus talking about teach and um, face-to-face teaching which we know the unions are getting very excited about um, and there's the general duty that even in in hr we know in terms of the health and safety um, work act but then there's the section of the employment rights act section 44 which has come come to into its own and has been referred to quite regularly um, which is that um, individuals can't be subjected to a detriment if they um, consider that they are in a serious or imminent danger and so that's been referred to. And so that may, means that there's even more fear, perhaps, and anxiety for managers um, to have these conversations because there's references to legislation where there wouldn't ordinarily be. And increasingly, there's a role, HR becoming health and safety experts where they perhaps weren't before. Line managers are having to have some responsibility for making a safe workplace where they didn't before. Um, and it's all, all of that, which means that actually it's added, it's added responsibility and added um, awareness that perhaps didn't happen prior to COVID and there were enough pressures on the sector with student fees etc even before um, COVID. Yeah and I think the, the other area that we're finding is being um, raised a lot is in relation to the Equality Act and again that's certainly nothing new it's you know by no means a, a new piece of legislation but I think in the con you know we've, we've been very used to dealing with um, the need to make reasonable adjustments in terms of physical impairments but over the, the last few years there has been a rise of um, you know the degree to which mental impairments are being recognized under the Equality Act and to, to some extent the the degree to which um, staff are um, requiring or expecting adjustments to be made in, in respect of mental impairments that do come under the remit of the Equality Act because they do have a substantial adverse long-term impact on their ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities and one of the the classic areas that we see that arising is in terms of workload and, and clearly that's one of the areas that has been significantly impacted by Covid now, obviously, the, the duty to make reasonable adjustments only applies to adjustments that are reasonable. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we're certainly not looking at um, reducing someone's workload to an extent that, that that's not reasonable for the institution. But it is something that line managers are actively having to think about and engage with. Yeah, and I think it's and it's how um, active you're being. It may not constitute a disability, but actually... Um, where's the line and it's a spectrum isn't it that disability is up this end and perhaps up that end is just a supportive employer um, yeah. enabling someone to come back, back to work that may genuinely feel um, anxious about it even though they don't have diagnosed anxiety disorder um, and, and and that's that's a, diff a difficult call isn't it um, that requires some um, support I think but I think we've thought about and advised clients practically as to how to deal with it and I think it's helpful to look at to look at the step change um, mentally healthy universities framework um, and ensure that there is as much importance on staff mental well-being as well as students mental well-being particularly as um, staff are increasingly have a part of their role if they're in face-to-face -face with students as looking after students um, it's different um, to perhaps other sectors so there is part of their role that is actually looking out and being that contact um, and looking after the mental health of, of students as well as their own mental health, but they need to be in a well place to be able to do that. Um, and that whole university approach and the community um, that the, the framework promotes and advocates is really something that's um, absolutely fundamental, I think. It's got some really good stuff in there. Um, that's the start. It's not certainly not the, um, the end, but it's certainly the, um, a start in terms of good work. Um, and making sure that the, they're aligned between staff and students rather than doing it separately because there's a lot of uh, efficiencies um, that can be made um, between the two, I think.
Yeah, I agree. And I think that then leads on to the point as to, you know, you go away and you do all this brilliant work and devise these policies and approaches, but then it's a question as to what you do with it. Um, because it can <laughs> sometimes, like, there's so much information out there that you, you, you've then got it floating all around in your head, but you don't mm -hmm. know how to communicate it. So I think there is a really important place for effective and live mental health policies, um, because ultimately, you can do all the good work in, in getting that information and communicating it to managers. But if employees aren't aware of what the institution's stance is on it and what um, really what provisions are in place to, to yes. assist in, in, in those sorts of issues, then you're, you're losing the benefit of that good work. And it will necessarily have to be a, a live and adaptable policy. I think the very fact that we're talking about it in a COVID context where if we were having this conversation a year ago, it would probably be slightly different in terms of the pressure. Yeah demonstrates that it's not going to be something which is a static document but I think I, I, I see the, the value in it referring to those various measures that are in place so whether that's the use of mental health first aiders that I know a lot of institutions yeah, are in, yeah. and which can be a really helpful resource for, for staff in having designated people to, to speak to in those situations whether it's uh, the, the publication of wellness action plans, um, stress risk assessments. There are so many different tools that can be brought together in one um, document, which can both give support to managers in knowing what tools they should be offering to their staff. And, and it can also, as I say, publicize the, the institution's position on, you know, effectively what, what provisions and measures are in place. Um, and ACAS has got some really good um, yeah. guidance in place for, for managers as well, because I think they really are key to ensuring that staff feel appropriately supported. Yeah. And I think, like you said, making it live in terms of we weren't working from home before, whereas now um, most people are, I know some have worked throughout, but there's things that actually mean that certain things in the policy need to change, don't they, to reflect the new working arrangements um, and how, how it's going to work in this new world um, or the new normal, um, as it's been called. Um, and that's really important. I think, um, you talked about line managers and I think it's in the discussions that we've had with clients it's, it's really clear that um, there is some pressure there in terms of line managers almost feeling um, like the filling in the sandwich so um, they've got the pressure in terms of high quality delivery um, and actually in pressure on fees and pressure on funding um, that we had in the sector even before COVID and that's coming down from leadership and then they've also got the responsibility for their staff and their teams in terms of mental health and, and, and making sure that they're supportive as line managers and so I think they're quite an important category of staff um, to support um, and actually ensure that they've got the t tools, the equipment to, to actually support and deliver um, mentally um, healthy workforce um, and I think it was actually mentally health um, it was mental health first aid that um, there was um, a report um, last year and they said that 69% of UK line managers say supporting employee well-being is a core skill but only 13% had received mental health training um, which is quite a stark contrast, but I think the, the recognition um, is a high percentage, is a start, isn't it? Because they acknowledge it as part of their role and it's then just creating the support, whether it's training um, in order to then make sure that they feel confident in, in handling it, whether it's having open conversations, being open and transparent about your own mental health. Yeah. I mean, there's been a lot, lots of that's been increasing, particularly on, on Saturday, wasn't there? There was loads of people sharing their own stories and I think as a line manager that's that's quite helpful um, in terms of opening and on, being honest so that your team are honest um, and then it's about workload isn't it if that's part of core part of your role what what is the time that you get to do that alongside your research your teaching and your administrative tasks um, that uh, are increasingly perhaps more time consuming where's this where's the space to take that extra um, responsibility and include and have your one-to-one -one conversations which now don't happen in the kitchen or in the corridor they have to be kind of scheduled don't they uh, it, it's a whole lot more conscious I think it needs to be now that we're perhaps not naturally coming across each other and not naturally having team meetings which are physical um, I think I think that's it's recognizing that important um, category of staff I think is is useful and key to yeah. it being successful. And I think there are different 
you know, I think, as you say, things have to be much more deliberate now, don't they, in terms of having those um, scheduled catch-ups. And I think yes. we've all fallen victim to some degree to, to Zoom and MS Teams fatigue, <laughs> where it feels like you're, you're constantly <laughs> on calls. But, but actually, I think there are, as you say, different purposes in different conversations. There are the one-to-one -one conversations, which are, are, are important for um, managers being able to communicate the fact that it is an open door policy and that staff are able to, to raise issues that they have um, and equally that those staff are able to be honest with their um, the people that they line manage as well as to the pressures that that, that impact on the institution. Yeah and, and the recognition from leadership that where that's coming from as well so actually if the line manager is translating a deadline etc um, and being open and, and managing upwards and downwards is 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 important isn't it? Um, and I think it was um, rec recognising and acknowledged that they don't have all of the answers and that as long as they're accessible resources and that the role of them in terms of signposting and making sure that people know where to find information rather than, rather than having to become mental health experts overnight, um, that, that's not um, part and um, that's not ex an expectation, but it's having the tools around them that they can access to be able to do it, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and the other point that I think that um, arises a lot in the working from home context, acknowledging now that there are likely to be a, a mix of staff working from some working from home, some working on campus, is the the, the need to have or, or at least recognise the the boundaries that exist. Because again, I think we've all we've all seen over over the last few months the extent to which home life can creep into work life and vice versa. When you are working from home, these with which you can you can find that leak between your working day and, and your um, non-working day. Um, and again, I think it, it, it's important to equip managers with the, with the tools to speak to staff about that, ensure that there are appropriate boundaries, yeah. place, making sure staff are using their time effectively. Um, as we acknowledged earlier, there's to some degree, there are going to be increased workload because there's increased work to be done as, as a result of the yeah. pandemic. But discussing with staff how they fit that into their working day and how they still have a degree of protection for their non-working time is, is really important. Yeah, it is. And I think um, we've also seen, I think it was in the People Management magazine for CIPG, that um, the focus on HR as well, that a lot of the impact of um, COVID on workplaces is people, isn't it? And so at the moment... Um, most clients in HR that I speak to are pretty exhausted. Um, and so I, th I think there's, there's a bit to kind of flag about actually looking after the mental um, well-being of HR professionals at the moment and, and actually um, they're supporting others <laughs> and how are they, how are they um, taking care of themselves um, and, and each other in HR departments. I think that's worth um, considering as well at universities at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's an, I mean, it's an interesting time. I think there was a, a um, quote, which is probably a, a good place to conclude, um, which was in the um, Mentally Healthy Universities framework, which was um, um, from, uh, which stated, it's simple, a business filled with happier people having good days at work is a better business. And that was um, Professor Sir Carrie Cooper from the University of Manchester which I thought was great. That does sum it up. Um, probably doesn't capture how hard it is to achieve, <laughs> which we've talked about. Um, but it does, it does um, sum up that, that actually how important it is and, and it's worth considering. It's worth making it a priority, isn't it? Um, and, and thinking about the practical things that we've talked about. Uh, um, so, yeah, obviously, if any, anyone else wants to share any tips, um, then that would be good, wouldn't it? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it'd be really good to hear um, how people are finding it in reality. And um, obviously, we spend a lot of time talking to clients about the issues we've just been speaking about. Um, but it'd be great to hear the, the kind of practical um, tips that people may have that either relate yeah. to things we've spoken about or, um, or otherwise. Yep. Good luck in uh, mentally healthy universities. Speak. <laughs> <laughs> bye, Sean. Bye-bye.